Uh, thank you. Welcome to Unity of Tampa. Thank you for coming to celebrate John's life today. It's very special to this church because John gave so much here. He spent nearly 15 years as our music director in two different time periods. And we are very honored to be celebrating him today. One of the gifts of today is that we're going to be singing and sharing his music. So we put together our old choir and new members as well. And we asked everyone if we could get together and sing a couple of John's biggest songs that matter to us. John was my personal choir, not personal, but my choir director for 13 years. And he shared so much of himself with all of us and we're better because of him. Many of us didn't get the chance to go back to choirs as adults until we had John McEwen. So this is a very special time for us. And honoring him through his music is really important. One of the things I would like to do today, if it's okay with you, and even if it's not, <laughs> is I would like to share a little bit about John's life because many of us have been on the journey with John for a portion of his life, but not all of us know the whole story. So we have the whole story today in bits and pieces, and I'm going to give you just some highlights, if I might. So first of all, uh, Kathy, you're the only one who knows the whole story. <laughs> so if we don't have these pieces right, you're going to have to correct us, okay? <laughs> So, you may or may not know, John was born in Tampa in 1962. He spent some years here in his youth at, because his, he was, his stepdad was stationed here, right? At uh, Scott Air Base first, that was in Illinois. First he was here, then he went to Scott Air Base in Illinois where his stepdad, Lieutenant Colonel John Gebner, was stationed. And sp John then spent some of his high school years in Tacoma, Washington. While John was passionate about music, he enrolled in, are you ready for this, in the Air Force Electronics School. <laughs> no one saw that one coming. In his late 20s, he returned to Tampa where his dad is also was a musician and many of the rest of his family lived. While in Tampa, John attended HCC and then USF, and that's where he met Tanya, and they were both piano students there. Tanya was the leader of John's fan club. She attended all of his band gigs, she broke down the equipment at night, and helped him for a long time on his music journey. When John was 30, Tanya and John got married at the art museum and shortly after that, John graduated with a degree in music education and he worked as a music teacher in the public school system. After his first child, Duncan, there's Duncan. After his first child, Duncan was born in 2001, John attended grad school to become a mental health counselor. Now many of you know, and Duncan told me this this morning, that John's story of all the work he's done in mental health counseling, there's a lot of good stuff on the internet about him. Some things will be taken down over time, so I encourage you, if you want to know more, to go look this up, because Duncan shared some awesome things with me this morning. And so John became a mental health counselor. This is now still 2001. And then Brenna was born in 2004. And in 2005, John released his first full CD, or original music, and later his second. And then in 2010, John, Tanya, and the two kids headed to Washington State. Very difficult time for us, because literally, Duncan was sitting on the piano bench in a little carrier for most of our choir practices, and then 
John's sister Julie brought her daughter to babysit Brenna and Duncan in the back of the choir, in the back of the sanctuary, and we all used to contribute toys and things to keep them busy. So when John announced that they were leaving, we were all devastated, to say the least, and we didn't know what was going to happen to us because, you know, we were good because of Tanya and John. Tanya, at one point, this is a great experience for me to recall because at one point, Tanya was the one actually conducting us, and John was at the bench. And then John was conducting us, and Tanya was at the bench. And we never knew if Tanya got benched because John didn't <laughs> like what she was doing or if it was more about the fact that John just wanted control over us. <laughs> because that was more like John, to take control over us. Anyway, John eventually, they, they moved, and we tried to continue, probably not as well as we could have. And he eventually came back, they all came back, and that's when John released another CD entitled, What I Came Here to Do, which is, very meaningful now. Next to John's unending love for his children was his passion for psychological theories like Carl Jung and the diagnosis such as dissecting DSM-4 and his love of creating and playing music. As a counselor, John was always working to improve himself while working to help others. And the more he helped others, the more he was evolving himself. Following John's passing, there was a client who shared with John's mom that John literally saved her life. Now you're going to hear a lot more about John's journey here at Unity of Tampa through Reverend Salen and Reverend Debbie Moss who actually brought him into the church. But what I also want to tell you is that we are very honored today that Nashville recording artist Julie Williams, who grew up in our church, flew in today. And she and Elliot Dickinson are going to perform one of John's songs, I Am With You. So I invite them now. Hello, everyone. As Elliot's getting set up, I just wanted to share that, as I mentioned, I grew up in this church. And actually, the first song I ever performed was when I was Mary in the, in the church play, uh, singing away in the manger. And John was on the piano. So my musical journey started with John. Uh, and I'm so appreciative of everything that he's done, not only for the church, but for me as a, in my musical journey. And I just wanted to share that. Feel my 
We have a video tribute that Duncan worked very hard to put together that we're going to share with you now. It's about 16 minutes, so I invite you to just relax. And I want to tell you that there's a portion where you'll see John conducting us in, a real in the Hallelujah Chorus. And the video is a little bit, there's some challenges in parts of the video, but I think you'll really appreciate seeing how hard he worked. It's been a lonely road, and traveling without a map. 
seems too perfect after all I've been through to find me here. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where it starts to get good.
definitely if you had turtle red on top on. So these are definitely spoiled. They are breeding water creatures. And here's another turtle. I saw, a, I saw a fish in your little pond out there. Yeah, they're and big fish. Like there were some big fish. Yeah. Yeah. I won't start it.
Okay. Got it. That last uh, piece of music at the uh, at a Christmas service. That's. I don't know if I can get through this or not. To be honest with you, I was doing good until I heard that music, and uh, that was just awesome. But let me start with the beginning. Well, my beginning with John. The first time I met John was in uh, 1998. He and Tanya attended a class that I was conducting for those people in the church who were thinking about becoming new members, joining the church as an official member. <coughs> and um, it may have been actually the, the very first new member class that I ever did. Tanya, do you remember that? I think it was, but I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. So, uh, I think uh, you became members, but didn't attend real frequently after that. <laughs> no, no excuses. No excuses. I know you had an excuse. Everyone does. <laughs> anyway, we're joking about this. You know that. So uh, in that class, I learned that John and Tanya were musicians. And I made a mental note of that and stored it in the back of my mind. And then it was just uh, two short years later that I recall that, that I stuck back there. Many of you know that in about December, the next time I saw actually John and Tanya was about December the 10th or 15th of the next year, 1999. And there was a real good reason I was seeing them. I was calling on them to come and bail us out because we were in a jam with uh, our music program for that year. We didn't have a, um, a director of music or a pianist. And uh, so it just happened that the two of them agreed to come and work at least for our special music program at Christmas. And uh, they blew the socks off the place. I mean, really. They stepped in at a time when we were in trouble. Not bad trouble, just trouble in getting things done the way we wanted them to do. And this was a very special event in our church, Christmas service. Not on Christmas Day, but the evening, I guess Christmas Eve. And uh, so they stepped in with a very short notice and took over a program and, and just jumped. I mean, right in the middle of it, and man, what they did was awesome for that Christmas. And the way I remember that always is at the very end of the service, Tanya, you got up and sang a song, Oh Holy Night, was that it? And uh, I'm telling you, it was just the most emotional thing I had ever experienced, I think, in church, period. It was just the most beautiful climax to the service that evening. We had great music and everything had gone along really well. But that song just brought it all together. And it was all because of the way John put it together. He did such an incredible job of just stepping into a place where he didn't know anyone in the choir. And he brought everybody along with him and they brought him along also because we had a magnificent choir the people in that choir were exceptional and so john just um he had a lot of great material to work with and he just did a great job with it but that meeting with john was very fortuitous in many different ways um, it was a big deal when he stepped in and took over that program. And then after that, 
I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I had a conversation with John and Tanya, and I wanted them to come and be the music directors of the church. And they were in agreement with that, and so we made a deal. We'd give them three months um, tryout time. And, of course, we never discussed it again after that. <laughs> we just kept rolling along with it because they were so good, and they fit in so well. And I say all of this just to pay tribute to John and what he did as the music director of our church and uh, how impressed I was. You know, when, when John came on board, I had a conversation with him, and I said, John, you're talking to a minister who knows absolutely nothing about music. The only thing I know about it is how to put a CD in my, at home or <laughs> turn on the radio, and if it's good music, I'll listen to it, and if it's not, I'll change the station. But that's about all I knew about music. And so I, gave, I turned it over to John. I said, you know, you're in charge of it. You've got to decide what music to play every Sunday. And from time to time, I'll be able to give you some direction in terms of what I'm going to speak about. I made no promise about that. But I gave, it, gave him the direction and, and the themes of what I was going to do from time to time. And so he would take it and run with it. And without him, I mean, he was a big support to me personally. It's hard for me to talk about him because I'll break up and it ain't pretty when I do that. <laughs> I would just have to sit down. So uh, that's how I, I, John, I met John and how we got working together. And then for the next 15 years, John and I worked together. Doing the, he did the music and I was doing other things. But I never had to worry during that time about the music. It was always incredible how he would come up with things that fit in and work so well with whatever I had planned for that Sunday. I liked what he did. I really did. I enjoyed the music put together. And sometimes he would come up with things that were a little bit off the wall. And I liked that even better, even more. <laughs> I was at that time in my life, I was really kind of rebelling against the old church music. And so when he came up with new things, I, I loved it. And John was great at that. And he did that either through writing his own songs or finding good songs that were being played in other places and bringing them to our church. John wrote several songs over that time period that I thought were worthy of being adopted by unity and just actually published by unity. But you know, in an organization as large as unity is, there are politics. And there's where the things break down sometimes. Difficult to get things done at times. There were too many people who had I shouldn't be talking about this, I guess, but John had difficulty getting his music through Unity because there were too many people who had positions that they were unwilling to allow others to come into and, and uh, perform and do work. But John was great. He, he was great for our church, and he, it's unfortunate that he wasn't great for the Unity movement. But being that as it may, John wrote songs, as I said, that I just loved. One of them, which I, th I see on the agenda that Nancy's going to talk about, so I'm not going to accept to say. My favorite that he ever did was, the, was recomposing, or I don't know how you put it, you just redo the whole thing, uh, the Our Father. The first time I heard that, I mean, it just struck me deep, a deep chord. I knew the words, but the music then that he put to that just really touched me deeply and I thought this is a song that should go nationwide it should go worldwide and I still think that today and uh, with the choir you know it was amazing what he could do with our choir uh, the way he could bring them together and and actually teach new songs and Nancy you'll speak to all this more than I can. I wasn't there. 
all I did was come in on Sunday and listen to what they had done. They'd been working on it for six weeks or six months, and and then hear the choir sing, and I and it was just mind-boggling that our our choir could really do all this music. It was great. You know, one of the things that still rings true right here today is the musicians that. Uh, John brought on board, Alvin, great musician. He's just incredible on the percussion side of things. You are. Really a great percussionist. Elliot. I've kind of watched you over the years, Elliot. John brought you along well and uh, gave you a lot of responsibility, and you've certainly rose to the occasion. You're a reflection of uh, who he was. Not your, not your actual playing or singing, but just a reflection of the kind of person he was in being able to identify good talent. I'm amazed. One of the things that I have noticed about Unitix, <laughs> many of you know what I mean. <laughs> Unitix are those who hear about unity and decide to stay. And they, decide, they do that because they become enthusiastic about the teachings that we have, presented in a different way. The same universal teachings taught by every major religion just presented a little differently. They, um, they decided to stay because of the acceptance they found in unity, and especially in this church, <laughs> Unity of Tampa. <laughs> I never saw anyone discriminated against here in this church, no one. They came because they liked being with like-minded people who were growing spiritually just like they were. And nobody had all the answers. And as we grow, we come to live the principles in everyday life. It's one of the great things about unity that teaches us. And I guess I'm preaching a little bit. I don't mean to get off the subject, but there's a purpose behind what I'm saying. As we grow, we come to live the principles in everyday life. And, and what I found for myself is that at a, at a certain point, one day you don't think about the principles anymore. Why? Because you've incorporated them into the being that you are and you're living your life through those principles. And you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think about love your neighbor. It's just you. It's what you do. You don't think about doing it any other way, but many other things along with that. I noticed then that many Unitics, after coming to Unity and getting what they need, and I don't mean that negatively, I mean that positively, they got the spiritual teachings they needed, and then they move along. I like to think that John learned what was important to him and moved along.
John was indeed a wonderful musician. And I think that he was actually born to be a great musician because everything he did was just so awesome and incredible. He could come up with some of the best things you've ever heard of, and it was just incredible. So we often talked about things like that when we were together. And I know how much he loved his children. He talked about them, loves them. I like them too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he and I had something in common. We talked about it several times, and it was about being in, in a situation where we both were the youngest in our family the youngest child in our family. And so over and over again, we would often talk about it because the youngest child, at least my experience and his, I think was about the same, doesn't get much attention. And I remember being very young and sliding in my, my gym in my family's house <laughs> that I didn't really get much attention. It was my two older sisters and my brother. Oh, my brother was the, you know, he was the king in the family. I think he still thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> but we often talked about that, and, and we talked about how we kind of felt left behind sometimes and uh, that we weren't able to get the same attention that everyone else in the family got. And so I thought that was really helpful for both of us to be able to talk about that. And so we did that. And we talked about, I talked about how often I felt ignored when I was a child because I was the last in the family. And I don't know what it was, but I never seemed to be able to connect with my father. I don't understand that. And I only say it because I don't know whether he had that same issue or not. I don't think we ever talked about that. But I just didn't seem to be able to connect with him. And, um, and several times he made it, comf made it real sure that I knew that he was not happy with me. So I was often ignored as a result of that, I believe. But anyway, here I am. I think I've made, made it okay. And, and I believe that if John could have stayed a little longer, that he would have been a different person at this point in his life. And so I, I keep that in my heart, and I um, am just very sad about what has happened. And now I'm going to cry. No, I won't. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> But it was just great to, to be with him, and we often had great talks together, and, and um, you know, we, enjo we enjoyed it. And being sort of similar in our conversations, it was, it was a lot of fun sometimes. So I um, will miss that, and I'm sure that we will all miss John because he was a great person. So what I'd like to do now is kind of close with uh, a little bit of a, a prayer. So if you'll join me, I would love to, to pray this. Anchored in faith, I claim peace to keep me patient and, and positive, guidance to show me the way healing to claim my wholeness and the abundant supply to meet every need. And so it is. Thank you. do one step. <laughs> My name's Babs, Barbara Lee, and um, uh, John was, <laughs> he was my partner in the 
Uh, he was my companion, um, and he's a, my best friend, a person that I could talk to about anything and who wouldn't judge. I would wait when I saw things or heard about things, I'd wait until it was my chance to get to see him and I'd talk to him about it. We got to share a lot of experiences together, uh, really fun things, um, movies and kayaking, and we got to talk about, he, he loved to talk about politics, humor, the environment. And he was a very funny, funny person. So totally, I was always was, um, gaga for him. <laughs> um, he was my master teacher, and I think that he taught, I, I was able to teach him some things too. Uh, and he's so well known for his genius in music, and I got to receive some of the bulk of that blessing in the past um, few years because um, uh, when I w when I was making dinners at my place and he was there, my kitchen is too small for two people <laughs> to make dinner, so his job was to play the keyboard, you know, keep me serenaded, <laughs> and um, he he could play. So many types of music. Um, he was working on a very complicated Chopin piece, and uh, he could bring up something in jazz like without even looking it up. Sometimes he'd bring up a book of old favorites, and uh, he would play Name That June with me. <laughs> so we had fun. In the evenings when we were done with the TV, because we did watch news together and, and funny shows together, then um, he would bring out his guitar and uh, practice, and together we would sing 60s and 70s old pop hits, and that was a lot of fun. We took turns taking care of each other, and I would say his was the last turn he, he had to take care of me because um, I went in for surgery in, um, in August, <laughs> And it was supposed to be a real simple thing, like one, one day in, same day out. But I ended up five days there <laughs> in the hospital. And he was there almost every day for me. And I ended up with a, um, a hairline fracture to this bone here. And I only have three more weeks on this, on this blocker. But it's been a long thing for me. So he was my caregiver. He moved in again for three weeks. And... And it is hard to be a caregiver to somebody. I mean, they always need something. And he was there for me all the time. Um, so on the Thursday before his 59th birthday, um, uh, he was dropping me off. And he said, will you be OK? And you know, I, I was sure I would be OK, because the bulk of my my needing him was over mostly. I, I was a lot more independent, and um, so uh, he was coming back on that Sunday, on his birthday Sunday, to celebrate with me after he was to be at his his with his family on Saturday to celebrate his birthday with with them. But um, he made transition on that Friday, the very next day. And all I can say is I'm so glad that I got to say the last words to him, which were, I love you. And um, I know that in my, in my spiritual teaching that, that I see him whole and happy, complete. And if he wants to, I hope I get to see him again. So Godspeed to John. Stand, would that be okay? Okay. I'm not trying to be a rock star, I'm just a little shaky. On the day my
my father died, I wrote a song called Love Lives On. It's the most well-written song I've ever put together. It came from the heart. I want to tell everybody here, love lives on. In spirit, we all carry those who have gone before us, who we've loved, who we've cared for, who we've known. And uh, they're always with us here in, in the next journey. That's my belief. And I feel it every day. And I don't want to be here today, but I am compelled to be. I don't want for my friend to be gone. I don't believe he's gone. I was kind of hoping this was some elaborate hoax and Ashton Kutcher was going to pop up and say, hey, you're punked. <laughs> but uh, here we are, and, and to see all of you here, it means so much to me that he's remembered and he's loved and that love lives on through John and all those that knew him. We met in college at the work campus of HCC. I'd never met a better piano player. And then it comes with John. <laughs> and then he picked up a guitar, and I go, well, he won't have that going on. And, well, there again, I was bested. <laughs> he was a fantastic musician. He was an amazing human being. Um, you know, we were the best of rivals. Um, and I always bowed to his greatest. He was always in the better band. He always had the better music thing going. And I just, he was my hero on top of everything else. Um, I just can't believe that only weeks ago he put his CD in my hand a and I went home and I go, let's see what this is all about. And he outgunned me again. <laughs> I spent five years and $30,000 on my CD. His was better. <laughs> the guy was great and he still is because he's here with us. Um, just not in the flesh. And I, I still can't believe he's gone. We just reconnected recently, and uh, after so many years, you lose track. And thanks to Facebook and the funny picture he has up there. Um, I, uh, who's this? Uh, this has got to be John. The twisted sense of humor right away told me it was him, you know? Um, and then we chatted on the phone. He came by my studio. He talked about doing some future recordings. We had plans. And then he was gone. This is why I didn't hold the microphone. Um, I just want to finish by saying what I started by saying. Love lives on. Carry John in your heart. Remember him always through his music and through our love for him. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. Oops. I'm going to. I know, but I'm, I'm shaking. So <laughs> it's amazing to see everyone here. Um, it's, it's coming home, and I see all of the. I'm Wendy Lee, by the way. Um, Emma's mom. All of the people here, the fabric of this community and unity have shaped my life and my children's life, and it's all interwoven. The, the, look at this power foursome here in this front row. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> and just, just so grateful. And through it all, John's music was that connective thread, and we can't even, even measure the impact of that. Because I think we, you just take it all for granted because it just flowed. I'm uh, just going to speak from the heart. A little fun fact. Um, my maiden name uh, is Ewan. So um, there's just that um, John McEwen, every time I heard Ewan, it was uh, just kind of felt, you know, c that connecting. And I remember the first meeting when they came in. And I think you underestimate the uh, feat that you as leaders had to go through with that transition. I remember it was very difficult. And I applaud you. And they had 
Tanya and, and John had big shoes to fill, and you came in and knocked it out of the park. And um, it was amazing. Emma uh, grew up in this church, as you know, and, and then babysat Duncan and Brenna. And I believe that was your first babysitting job. And now look at her career. So you were her guinea pigs. <laughs> what you may not know is that um, John uh, was their piano teacher. And on Sundays after church, he would come to our house and teach Jillian and, and Emma piano. And for like, I think a, Jillian tried to play guitar for like a two week career. <laughs> and he taught that as well. And at one point he said, you know, we need to ha have a recital. And he, said, and he said, because that makes you push yourself more. And, and, and he was right. And so we had a recital, and here bringing it all full circle. He also told Allison, I think, Allison, you were released from your contract with John, is that correct? <laughs> um, that's an inside joke, you can ask Janet and Allison about it later. But uh, Janet, had um, a, re a recital, hosted the recital at her house, and so we all played. I played even. He encouraged me, and I did two Beethoven sonatinas. Yeah, with music. I'm, I, I call myself a technician, not a musician, but it was that kind of um, gentle uh, encouragement and prodding that he had that just uh, encouraged everybody to, to go one step further. But most importantly is that we had uh, what we call, you'll see a white chair out there, and that is called the Mr. John chair. And he sat in that chair teaching Emma and Jillian on those Sundays. And uh, long after they stopped playing, it was always called the Mr. John chair. So it would be one of those, you know, panic in the morning, where is the form that we have to have in for the field trip? It's on the Mr. John chair. So that became the thing. So every time we needed to uh, um, have something in an important place, it was on the Mr. John chair. So I uh, brought that chair, w painted it white, and brought uh, six colorful Sharpies, and I'm going to ask that everybody sign it and, uh, and fill it with your love and um, it can be underneath, it can be on the legs or whatever, and then it can go to Duncan or Brenna or to the church, it'll be whatever, but it will, I'm passing the Mr. John chair on to you all for, for you to have. <laughs> and as Janet knows, who is the, the, the queen of uh, furniture and antiques, she says, that's a really nice chair. <laughs> so, but one of the moments, and Emma, forgive me, because this is coming out, is uh, he, John also taught at, when we were at the Patel Conservatory, he taught Rock School Junior there also. And so one day he came early and he said, uh, Wendy, can you sit down? I want to play a song I wrote for you. I mean, not for you, a song I wrote, and I want your opinion. I actually think it was a song for Tanya because it was this tender love song. And so I sat down, and he's, you know, you know, serious and, you know, playing the song. And then everybody who's a parent knows that when there's absolute silence, you panic when you don't hear your children or when they're shrieking. So it's like one end or the other. So all of a sudden, he's playing, and I'm hearing just intense screaming from the bedroom, from Emma and Jillian, and I'm trying to focus on John, and he's playing, and I'm like looking, and, and the next thing I know, and this is a little bit blurry, Emma is carrying, or Jillian's hopping out, and she had Jillian hogtied, okay, <laughs> wrist and feet, and uh, screaming, but John's still playing <laughs> and playing, and I'm trying to like focus, and I'm like there, and then I could see that Jillian was panicking because she couldn't get out of this, you know, this terrible um, situation with rope. Where they got it, I have no idea. And suddenly, Jillian decided she was going to escape, so she goes hopping <laughs> uh, through, t bound, and falls over down the stair. 
and I was like, John, I'm really sorry. It's a beautiful song, but I've got to, I've got to go like untie my child. <laughs> so it was an epic parent fail, and uh, but we will always remember that. We talk about that often and laugh until we cry. Um, two last things. The last time I saw John, um, thank you for posting that picture. Um, actually, it was for, because of Scott Berry, who I posted, uh, I was at an organization and I needed a clear podium. And Scott said, well, you could borrow the, the Unity one. And John and Duncan brought it over. And so it's really meaningful that I'm standing here because that was the last time I saw him. But the most meaningful memory I have of John is after 9-11. And I remember that we all flocked to the church because we were starving for answers and something. And I believe, in my, this is my memory of it, that I came in late, true to form. And somehow I think I came in the side door and I sat in the front row and he just started playing Imagine. And it was what everybody needed. We just sobbed collectively as a spiritual community and as human beings. And so uh, every time I hear that song, I think of John and his intuitive way of knowing what we needed spiritually through music. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't tell Nancy I was going to talk, and I promise I'm going to keep this quick because, oh, wow. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, what? I'm Tanya <laughs> McEwen. <laughs> and obviously, I was married to John <laughs> formerly. Thank you so much for talking, Babs. That was great speak yeah you saw plenty of pictures I can't believe the one where I was giant I gained 40 pounds <laughs> with each child L I'm not exaggerating um, anyway I'm gonna keep this very short and you know the funny thing about John is like he was not a saint this <laughs> this service makes him sound like he was a saint <laughs> everybody <laughs> everybody that knows him he was not a saint and um, I'm not trying to be a downer I just, I'm, I have to be a, a truth speaker. <laughs> but the reason I'm saying that, or Susan said it best. She texted me. She's like, John was a PIA, but we all loved him. And he was a definite pain in the ass sometimes. So <laughs> I just want to say a few things. I realize this is being live streamed, so I better be careful. But <laughs> in the early 90s, we met in the hallway of the USF Music Building, and when I saw his blue eyes, I felt an immediate connection. As we started dating, I felt he was my soulmate. I mean, there was really something special there. We got married when I was 24, which sounds way too young now. Luckily, we waited a little bit to have the kids. Uh, we had many challenges, which I won't go into here. But I wanted to talk about how our life journeys intersected and talk about healing and recovery. In the beginning, we both drank and partied quite a bit. As part of my denial, I thought that he was the one with the drinking problem. <laughs> and I spent many years in Al-Anon, a 12-step program for the loved ones of alcoholics. It was only many years later that I realized I was an alcoholic. And after many attempts to stop drinking, I can honestly say I haven't had a drink since February 15, 2015. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and I mean I, I don't know if you, most people in Unity even know that I, I don't talk to people about that so I just wanted to mention it here because it's part of his story I, I bring this up because John had also attempted many times to stay sober 
And as far as I know, he embraced AA finally in early 2021 and was really doing the deal, as we say in the rooms. I was so happy for him. And actually, that made it extra tragic that he transitioned because, like someone said, he was changing. He was always on a spiritual journey and seeking. And he was, he was maturing and growing up. Since then, periodically, Johnny, we always called him Johnny, or JB for Johnny Baby. I think that's what his mom called him, and Julie. <laughs> Johnny would tease me about when he was going to hear my step nine, which is amends, to him. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was going to get such a laugh. <laughs> I must admit, I didn't finish my step nine, and he was one of the ones I left out. So that's why I got up here. I will make living amends by being there for Duncan and Brenna, uh, supporting them emotionally, physically, and financially whenever needed, if Duncan ever needs any money. <laughs> He's been very good. He's never asked me for cash yet. <laughs> he moved out last year. <laughs> I promise to continue to be the best mom I can be, or even improved. After John died, the kids reminded me I can't go anywhere now. I'll do my best to stick around on this earth. So, Johnny, even though you were difficult to be with and we drove each other crazy, I always wanted you to be happy and to find what you were seeking on your spiritual journey. I wanted you to heal your pain, including any that I may have caused. <laughs> may you now be at peace and rest from all your struggles in this life. You know, everybody before um, we started today was worried about how much time you were going to be here. But I want to tell you what I said to Tanya when she said something to me. I said, John lived his entire life, and we're trying to wrap it up in an hour and a half. <laughs> so you're here to honor John, and we appreciate your patience, but we really want this to be a tribute to him, and we appreciate that you understand that. I want to make one comment, and then I'm going to introduce um, the first song that we're going to do for you. Um, you know, Tanya said it seemed like John was just getting to the place where he was coming into his own. But, you know, I like to believe this about life, that John did exactly what he was here to do. And John left exactly when he was supposed to leave. He had lived his life. He had left his legacy. He had brought his children into the world. He had had these wonderful women in his life and people he loved. He expressed himself. And one of the last two things he and I did together is I was asked to speak at a funeral not too long ago, and I called John to see if he would be the pianist there. And so John and I were doing a memorial together. And now I'm standing here thinking, we're about, you know, what just happened here, right? But one thing that caught my eye when we were watching the Hallelujah Chorus, I don't know that you would know this, but John was always on his tippy toes when he was leading, okay? And you may have seen in the Hallelujah Chorus, he did this. <laughs> well, that wasn't this. That was more, more, more. So John, by the end of a song, would be leaning over us, screaming at us to give him more. And we're going to do our best today with him. And so one of the things I want to say is that, John, we are about to do There Is Love, that we are changing the program, changing your program. Um, but we're going to do the song There Is Love, and then we will perform the Our Father, but I'll do an introduction for that before. So I'd like to invite the choir up. This came off of John's song, 
uh, let our heart, his CD, Let Our Hearts Unite. Sorry. And I'm actually putting John down to watch us. It wouldn't be the same without him. Does that block anybody's view if I do that? Okay, there you go, buddy. See what you think. King. I want to read this to you if I can. Uh, thank you. So when John decided he wanted to do the Our Father song, and as Alan pointed out, he, this was the biggest thing we felt he had ever done. And he came out and he said, I put together this song, and I, I want the choir to sing it. And we were all looking at this 10-page thing thinking, is he kidding? And so we decided that we were going to do this song 
and help him. Well, we not only did the song, but then John and I wrote this blurb together to introduce the music, and my husband and I decided we were gonna financially support the production of this song. So we helped John make this all happen, and we were so honored to be doing this at the time. And this is what we wrote. When music director John McEwen decided to compose a temporary version of the Lord's Prayer, he had no expectations beyond seeing one of the choirs he directed perform it. After months of intensive work and over 200 changes and edits, the song was performed for a Tampa Bay church, receiving a standing ovation. Weeks later, the song was performed a second time and received the same response. Nothing could have prepared John for the weeks that followed. People that heard the song approached this songwriter and musician, suggesting that he consider unveiling it to the world. An outpouring of unconditional financial emotional support ensued, and within only a few months, John was busy recording the song in a professional studio. People of all ages have been inspired by this powerful version of one of the world's most commonly recited prayers, and choirs around the world are beginning to sing it with joy in their hearts. We know you will have the same experience. That's what we wrote back then.
I mean, they sang this with masks on, which that's just incredible. I'm so happy and grateful that the choir came back to do this. Thanks, everybody, for your patience and sitting here for so long. Um, Nancy, do we have anything else? of leading us in the prayer of protection sure. and we're sure. using John's name so okay is it up is it up for me uh no but <laughs> can you give me the little <laughs> thing for her no it's okay <laughs> well we we did it a different way okay okay oh and thanks again Ellen and Debbie for being here they were the ministers for so many years uh, The prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds John. The love of God enfolds John. The power of God protects John. The presence of God watches over John. Wherever he is, God is, and all is great. Okay. Oh, good. Julie Williams, thank you again for flying in from Nashville. She's <laughs> Her career is really taking off, and um, I'm so glad, especially Julie and Kathy, that you guys could be here today. Every, David flew in from South Carolina. Just thank you, everyone, for s who's here, and I hope I have this much love in the room when I transition. Thank you. Guess what? We have a ton of food and water over there on tables. And John, we have three of John's CDs if you want to. We're asking for love offering. Um, so, yeah, hang out and talk if you want. I'll be around.